Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to the Graphs and Matroid seminar. Today we have Matt Colson, who's at the University of Waterloo, uh, who's going to be talking about strong components of the directed configuration model. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just full screen this. Um, yeah, there we go. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, so it's a slightly um, different um, talk from what I think we usually get in the seminar. So I'll try and um, go slowly and feel free to um, stop me at any point if you um, get lost. Um, but yeah, so um, I'll start off by um, talking about some um, different um, random graph models that are the kind of commonly studied models. Um, and these are kind of the base models that we look at. We look at their properties and then we ask in some more complicated model, does this still hold? Is it interesting? Or maybe is it interesting that it holds in a different way or that it just doesn't hold altogether? Um, this is the kind of base level random graph model is the Eddish Rennie random graph, uh, which is commonly uh, denoted by GNP, where we take each edge with probability P. So every edge can occur. Um, and this graph has a phase transition um, when P is about one on the number of vertices um, from where we go from having a really sparse graph where there's not very many edges and there's not many um, components and all of the components are small and uh, kind of boring to having a graph where there's one huge component where everything kind of happens. Um, and so this is the phase transition that, that's why GNP graph model introduced like 60, 70 years ago is still of interest today is that um, just this one point, um, we go from being super small, essentially, to kind of having some kind of global structure. Uh, and there's also a directed analog of this, which is um, called DNP, or the binomial random digraph, where each arc will take with probability P independently again. and the one of the most interesting things about this model is that it's if we look at a um, slightly different version of the component, the phase transition is at the exact same point P is equal to one on N, which I think is kind of a really interesting thing. And so the um, question that you ask is what happens in more complicated models? And so after you've studied JNP, the Probably the first step up is um, random graphs with a given degree sequence. Um, and so this is the configuration model um, where what we want to do is we want to sample a random graph uniformly at random with a given degree sequence. But in general, this is a super hard problem. And so the configuration model is a very, very good approximation of a uniformly random graph with a given degree sequence. Um, and so you make the configuration model by, for any a given vertex, we um, associate the uh, degree many stubs with it um, that we want its degree to be. And then we pick a uniformly random perfect matching to turn these into edges. So if we imagine that we have a degree sequence where we want three vertices of degree one, one of degree two, and one of degree three, then um, we have these kind of balls of um, vertices, these five balls that I've put on the screen. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pick a perfect matching um, of all of these um, in some way. So this is a perfect matching. And then we'll um, kind of contract these balls down to be vertices and give us a random graph. And so if the graph that we get out of this is simple, then we have a uniformly random simple graph. But it is entirely plausible that, say, we'd um, connected two of the um, vertices for degree two with the vertex of degree three, making a multiple edge. Um, and so this is why this model is only like a really good approximation of a uniformly random graph with this degree sequence. So conditioned on the fact that we see a simple graph when we do our sampling, then we have 
this kind of uniformly random graph with a given degree sequence. Um, and so the directed analog of this, we're going to do the exact same thing. Um, the direct configuration model, each stub has a direction, either it's an out stub, um, so it's so we draw an arrow going away from it, or it's an instub, so we want an arrow coming towards it. And so the way that we deal with this is we'll pick a we'll take all of these stubs from a legitimate degree sequence with the same number of instubs as out stubs, um, and we'll pick a random perfect matching of the instubs to the out stubs so that each um, of the edges in this um, perfect matching um, is like an actual directed edge. And so this is this is actually an easier model to sample from in general, but it's a diagraph, so it's slightly more complicated, of course. Um, and so this um, directed configuration model is the model that I'm going to be kind of talking about today. This is, um, so there's a lot known about the configuration model, and directed stuff has a lot um, that we don't know about it, um, and directed has been quite um, neglected over the years, and so it's it's about time to put some of this um, right and do some um, cool things with the direct configuration model. Um, and so the kind of like the part of the model that we're interested in is the connected components. And so in a graph, we all know what a component is. It's the maximal connected subgraph that contains a given vertex. It's a nice, easy thing. You can just look at a graph and see its components. Um, and it's um, you can work out what they are in like super in linear time. You can do whatever you want um, and it's easy. The directed graph is um, a bit different because you have a few different kind of choices of what the um, component structure that you're interested in is going to be um, because of the nature of the edges having directions on them. That leads to kind of there are four different types of components that people are interested in. So the first and the simplest um, type of component is the weak component. And so this is the component containing a vertex, which is in the um, underlying um, graph. And so this is just pretend the X edges don't have directions on them anymore. What happens in the underlying graph? Um, and then we've also got like two um, kind of things that are related to exploration processes, which is the in and the out component of a vertex. And so these are the kind of like, where can you get with um, out edges from a given vertex or where can you get with only using in edges from a given vertex? And the strong component is the um, kind of um, smallest components. And so these are the, um, vertices um, such that you can go from one vertex to another with an out path and from one and also from um, one vertex to other with an in path. So what we want is we want to be able to essentially have a cycle containing um, both vertices if they're in the same strong component. And so I've just got a few pictures. So we've got a simple, uh, a little simple direct graph. Um, and we're looking at this middle vertex. Everything forms the weak component. Um, the in component is everything but this um, one edge pointing to the left. The, um, um, the out component is everything but this edge pointing inwards. And then the strong component is just this um, little triangular cycle. Um, because um, for these other two vertices, once you Get it, get there. You can't get back, and that's kind of the essentially the definition of the strong component is that you can both get to a vertex and get back to your original vertex. Um, and so, in general, um, when we're studying directed graph models, um, the weak component um, in some of them is interesting, and in some of them it's not interesting for various reasons. Sometimes it can be reduced to a graph problem, 
um, notably the configuration model it can't, um, but we're not going to talk about that one today. Um, but also there's the strong component, which is the type of component that I'll be talking about today. So these components that are kind of like generalized cycles. Um, and so that's our components. Um, <clears throat> and so what we're interested in in this um, directed configuration model is where's the um, kind of threshold to have a giant strong component that takes up most of the vertices. And so this is a question that was answered uh, by Cooper and Freeze a number of um, years ago and has been improved a little um, subsequently. Um, so what we're going to be, uh, what I've been working on is kind of looking at this kind of threshold. And if we look really quite close to the threshold, what does the graph look like at this point? Um, and so just to remind, just in case that we need a uh, call, so we've got a sharp threshold function. If um, the probability that we have a property tends to zero, if, the, um, if we're below a threshold, it tends to one, if we're above a threshold, and crossing kind of sharp thresholds often kind of structure and behavior can change drastically in, a, in some way in like a number of stages often. And so there's kind of five different um, kind of steps in general. Um, so you go from being subcritical where you're definitely well below your threshold function. Um, and then you go to a barely subcritical point where we're just ever so slightly below our threshold function, but by a um, asymptotically negligible term. Um, and so this is the, the bit that I'm gonna be looking at today, um, this um, barely supercritical. And so this and the barely supercritical are kind of interesting because they're really demonstrative of how the, the phase transition happens um, for a sharp threshold. So generally isn't just a simple matter of we go up to some point and then instantly there's a massive component or there's instantly some new structure. It's the structure slowly forms as we're going very, very close to the threshold and then just a little bit past it, um, kind of on both sides of this threshold, the kind of, if we're um, asymptotically close but not actually there, something interesting and um, tangible is happening. Um, so the, the other kind of thing is there's a critical window in most cases where everything looks the same and looks exactly like what you'd be exactly at the point of the threshold in some very small range around the um, threshold function. And so then, as I said, there's a very critical and a supercritical. And so we, and so just as an example of this, because this is super abstract um, way of presenting a threshold, we've got GMP, which maybe some of you have seen, we know that it didn't, um, the um, existence of a giant component undergoes a sharp threshold at this point, P is equal to one on N. Um, and so the kind of original result of Ed Brenny kind of told us what happened in the subcritical regime and the supercritical regime and since then, since then there's been kind of stuff which has happened in the middle. So subcritical, the largest components are size logarithmic. In the barely subcritical, we know what the component size is. Um, we can write it down. It's an ugly expression, but it's notably quite um, a lot bigger than um, logarithmic if we have um, a parameter which is like one minus little o one on n. It's like the little, it's like one on the little o one term squared in size. Um, and then the critical window, um, everything looks similar. The largest components are of size n to the two thirds. And also there's a cool scaling limit where Aldous said that if you divide the sizes of the components by n to the two thirds, actually there's a lot of these components and the sizes of them um, are related to a Brownian motion in some way. 
Uh, and then in the very supercritical, we're seeing that this giant component is starting to form kind of like at a rate, uh, like at a rate related to epsilon, this kind of how just ever so slightly bigger than one on n we are. And then once we get supercritical, um, where we have like a constant over n fraction of the, of the um, probability that we have an edge, then the largest component is some function um, related to this constant on n. Um, so this f of c times n up to a, a low term. Um, this f of c is zero and goes to one as the probability gets bigger and bigger. And so I think I've kind of talked enough about all of the different okay, um, bits related to the talk. So I should probably um, actually um, say what, um, I don't know, maybe I should talk about the configuration model. I was thinking that I'd be talking about my result. Um, so the configuration model is just the graph version. Um, so I'll try and be precise here, say configuration model at any point that I just mean graphs and for and directed if I mean directed. So in the configuration model, we have um, two um, important parameters of the degree sequence. So we have one, which is the second moment of the degree sequence minus two in essence, and the second one, which is um, basically the third moment of the degree sequence. Um, and so the minus twos come from um, various, for various reasons, but essentially if you have a graph of minimum, uh, essentially intuitively it's minimum degree, um, if every degree is kind of like two on average, then you'll get a vertex will um, be able to um, see one vertex in one direction, one vertex in another direction, although it's not direction because it's a graph, but essentially we can make long paths um, once the average degree is at least two, um, which is roughly what this is. And so the Lyon read is a very famous uh, result on this, which says at the point Q equals zero, we have a phase transition where we go from having tiny components of logarithmic size to having huge components of linear size. And so this is probably the most famous result about the configuration model. Um, and so then subsequently, um, Janssen and um, Kluczak um, um, proved some stuff about like the barely subcritical case. And, um, uh, but no, that was a very super, super critical case um, based on um, how these parameters relate to each other. Um, we find that there is like some growing component size um, if we're quite close to the threshold. And um, Tommy and Malloy um, showed that there's like this critical window phenomenon where if um, this parameter n cubed by r squared is constant, then we have a non-concentration of the size of the giant component. Um, there's also a um, scaling limit result by um, various uh, authors, um, including uh, Dara van der Hofstadt and various um, other people. Um, um, and then the directed case we should imagine that maybe we're just going to um, augment these parameters a little bit so that it does something um, and looks more directed. And so that's basically exactly what we have. We have three parameters. We have this key parameter is the same as before with a minus one instead of a minus two, um, basically because um, yeah, in and out degrees are both smaller, so you need a minus one instead of minus two. Um, and then the R's, we have um, a, um, in like an out R and an in R, and so you can imagine these as kind of like the third moments of the degree sequence, like the twice in once out and the twice out once in moment, as it were. Um, 
And so, as I said earlier, um, Cooper and Freeze, a long while ago, um, showed that there exists a phase transition about the point Q equals zero, where we go from having um, from not even having um, cycles um, of more than constant size um, to going to have um, a giant strongly connected component of um, linear order. And so obviously we don't just go from having constantly sized cycles to having something of linear order. There's got to be something in the middle. And so this is why we want to kind of study more and ask more questions about um, what happens here, what happens next. And so my result is then quite long, so feel free to not actually then read the result itself. But the important thing to know is that this is kind of like a fairly subcritical result where we have um, some parameter nqq by r minus r plus um, tending to minus infinity. This looks like the um, Eddish um, Rennie kind of parameter as well. And then when this happens, we can prove that there are no um, complex components or long cycles where a complex component um, is a strongly connected component, which is anything that is not a cycle. And so in particular, it needs to have more edges than vertices. Um, and it also needs to be strongly connected, of course. Um, and then moreover, and so that's kind of like the bulk of the result. There's no complex components and there's no really long cycles. And then also there's this low bound, the probability that the kth longest cycle has length at least alpha times Q inverse is some um, really ugly function um, with a really ugly parameter. Um, and so this kind of function here um, comes from a Poisson distribution. And so this is um, the probability that a Poisson distribution is um, at most, um, either at most or at least k, I can't remember which way under this, but it's um, Poisson, it's, the way that we prove this is that we show something is Poisson distributed with um, this mean psi alpha. Um, and so this is a nice result. It essentially completely characterizes um, what happens in this fairly um, subcritical um, region, um, as long as you believe that this um, condition on the um, fairly subcriticalness um, is kind of tight, which I believe it is, um, certainly until we have vertices of super large degree. Um, and so um, I'll move on to uh, talking about um, how we'd uh, go about proving um, such a result. Um, and so the general kind of philosophy behind proving the result is that there's um, like three different um, things that we want to prove. We want to prove that there's no complex components. We want to prove that there's no really long cycles. And we want to prove this result on how long is the longest cycle. And so this is three um, separate little results, which all together kind of tell us what goes on. Um, and so we'll start with the kind of, there's no really, really long cycle um, result. Um, and so just for Gravity, we know how many edges, we know how many vertices we have. Um, and so to show that there's no long cycles, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to show that there's no absolutely enormous cycles. <clears throat> and from then we'll show that there's no cycles that are between like long and enormous. Um, and so We'll choose any function, which is this size that I've uh, written down here, that's suitably big. And so the idea is that this function is big enough that um, actually the out exploration process is bounded above by this um, function. Um, and so the out exploration process, we take a vertex, we start at it and we just 
look forwards and we ask um, how far do we get when we visit each vertex in turn and look at its um, out neighbors. So we go forwards, go forwards and find all of its out neighbors. And so the way to show that the out exploration process doesn't go to get too big is to um, compute its drift and show that the drift is nicely concentrated. So the drift, by drift, I mean like, what is the expected change in the um, number of um, vertices that we're viewing this kind of exploration process as a counting process where we look at a vertex, we'll add the number of um, neighbors and we'll remove this vertex. We have a counting process. Um, and um, hopefully this counting process dies out quite quickly. So it goes up a bit and then we found all of the out neighbors. And so it just goes that back down to zero. Um, and so the drift of the exploration we're going to denote by QT, which is perhaps um, indicative of the fact that this is where our parameter Q from earlier comes in this kind of second home run parameter and that's because we take a um, vertex, I don't know if you can see my hand, but we take one of these vertices, the out degree of a vertex bound by the um, exploration process um, follows a size biased version of the um, distribution of the degree sequence. So by that, I mean, we're more likely to find a vertex of high in degree than we are to find a vertex of low in degree. And so this being, and so essentially we're augmenting our distribution by multiplying um, by the, in, multiplying the probability of finding a vertex by its in degree. And then dividing by the mean, uh, just to keep things nice and actually being a probability distribution. Um, it's this Q is actually um, to, turns out to be the expectation of the um, size biased um, degree distribution minus one, um, which is about what you'd expect if we're, we're finding all of the first things and then we're taking one off for uh, um, the vertex that we've just looked at. Um, and so that's why Q comes about, and it's also why um, why Q equals zero is this um, phase transition. It, intuitively, it's because if Q is greater than zero, our kind of counting process is going to go on forever. And so we just remember that um, we have Q less than zero as this drift is small and so we sh what we should expect is that we should expect that we go down to zero pretty quickly um, and by pretty quickly I mean quicker than this function f um, and so the kind of making this rigorous is that we can show that the um, this um, drift of the exploration process is bounded uh, between 2q and q of 2 um, and we can also concentrate it to stay inside of this region until time f. And so this drift is really quite uh, negative for most of the time that we're in, for all of the time that we're interested in doing the um, exploration process. So as I said, this QT is concentrated inside this region. And so it's super good for us. It means that the process is going to die out nice and quickly. Um, with a nice, really overpowered result of um, dube, we'll define a stopping time, which for anyone that doesn't know a stopping time, a stopping time is of a random process is just any time in the process, any, any random variable in the process that we can say that tau equals t can be determined completely at the time um, t. So the question, so things that are stopping times are things like the first time a certain event occurs, 
and things that aren't stopping times are things like the last time something occurs because we don't know when something occurs if it's the last time, but if we something occurs, we know that it's the first time. Um, and so this is the definition of a stopping time. It's much more, a little bit more technical, but it is essentially information up to time t tells us whether tau is less than t. Uh, and there's a really nice um, theorem for stopping times, which says if we are a super martingale um, and we have a stopping time, then the expectation of the process at the stopping time is less than the expectation of the process when we start it. Um, and just by the way that we defined our like counting process, we have a kind of a super martingale of this y times y sub the min of t and tau plus q times the min of t and tau about two uh, because we showed that qt is certainly like um, the expectation of qt is less than um, q on two. This is a super martingale, which means the expectation of the next step is less than the expectation of the step we're on. Uh, and so uh, we can just compute some expectations at the point tau um, and rearrange it to get bound on the expectation of tau. It's the to be at most like two times the degree of the vertex of start at by q. And Markov tells us that the probability that we um, are equal to s at this stopping time as opposed to having died out at this stopping time is really small. And then um, summing of uh, all vertices tells us that the number of vertices in long cycles is little o of one. So with high probability, we don't have any of these really long cycles. And so in particular, this kind of exploration process we had, this dies out quickly, there's no long cycles because there's no vertices that last long enough. And so that's all I have to say about these super long cycles. And thankfully, shorter cycles are much nicer and much easier to talk about because all we've got to do is count some of that stuff. And so when we've got a configuration model, we can um, have a bunch of vertices. And the nice thing about the configuration model is that counting things is quite, quite doable. Uh, so if we want to connect a vertex of degree um, of degree s to a vertex of degree t, then the probability that we get one of these connections is essentially s times t divided by the number of edges. And so to find a cycle of length k, all we need is k vertices in a loop. Um, and then we sum over the, um, and then we take the product of all of these kind of terms to find each edge. And then we sum over all of the possible uh, choices of the vertices. Um, and if we swap the order and remember what um, Q was, um, we can give a nice bound on this and do another sum and pretend it's an integral. Uh, and we get that it behaves like an e to the minus lambda by lambda um, for some large value of the parameter, this integral disappears. So as the parameter g times absolute value q is um, grows to infinity, this um, integral uh, goes to zero um, just by the fact that it's um, integrand is tending to zero too. Um, and that's all that we really need to do about short cycles. And actually, complex components are just as easy because mm. actually they have more edges than cycles, and so they're much nicer to sort out. Um, and also, we've already sorted out these long cycles. We know that there's none of them. Um, and if there's no long cycles, what we need is either we need two short cycles, which are connected by a single vertex, or two short cycles, um, which um, are intersect in a chord. So this is 
thinking about it, it's like two cycles at a vertex or a theta graph, uh, where it's two, uh, two, two parts of the theta in one direction, one part of the theta in the other direction, but that's basically irrelevant. These three flow graphs are all, we know that the first doesn't account, um, exist and because there's more edges and vertices, it's really quite easy to show that there's neither of these other two, um, which, and so that's all that we need to do to show that there's no really long cycles and there's no complex components. And so the final part of the result, I'll go back to hopefully it won't. So if we remember the last part of the result is that the probability that the case longest cycle has some given length. Um, and we have this pass on type parameter um, with this um, integral term that we um, was actually very much the um, term that we had tending to zero earlier because the parameter alpha was growing to infinity, uh, but this time it's a finite thing. Um, and so here um, we're going to use some rather um, high powered machinery, which is um, what's uh, known as the um, Chernstein method. Um, I've written kind of the theorem out, but I would not recommend reading it. It's complicated. Um, but essentially it says, if you can count something with indicator random variables and there's a, and um, there's a coupling for any single indicator variable where you have your probability space, you have your probability space and you say, suppose that we always have a coupling such that we know what conditioning on a given indicator being um, equal to one looks like, then we have this absolutely disgusting bound on the um, um, on the distance between our random variable, which is a sum of indicators and a Poisson random variable. Um, and so the distance is the total variation, which is um, enough to show um, convergence in distribution, say, um, asymptotically. Um, and so the only real important thing of note here is that um, the couple, couplings are generally really hard to make hold. And for this theorem, we need an exact coupling. We can't have something approximate. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to work with um, what I call principal subgraphs, um, which are um, subgraphs um, of the uh, model. And we also specify what connects to what. So instead of saying this vertex is connected to that vertex, we want we say this vertex is connected to that vertex and it's this stub of the um, that we used from this vertex connect to this stub of the other vertex. Um, and so this allows us to make the computations easier at the expense of some notation. Um, and so then we'll say that stuff is, and so then for this theorem, we have like strong dependence where we share a vertex and weak dependence where we uh, don't share a vertex. I'm not actually going to go into the technical computations so we can safely ignore that. The only thing I'm going to kind of talk about is how are we going to make a proper uh, coupling to ensure that the configuration model contains a given cycle where we start with an out stub, we go to an in stub, and then we pick an out stub of the same vertex to go to an in stub of the next vertex and so on. Um, and so the way that we do this coupling is for each edge of the cycle, we say, if these, if we have a, um, what do you call it? If we have a um, 
a, uh, if the um, configuration model um, that we sample has the stubs connected, then we do nothing. And if the configuration model um, has the stubs not connected, then what happens instead is that the first out stub is connected to some um, other in stub and some other out stub is connected to our in stub and we're going to rewire and replace these edges um, by just swapping um, what goes to what. So just here's a pictorial kind of example. We've got um, this um, first out stub connected to some A minus and then B plus connected to um, this in stub that we want connected. So we want this edge here. What we're going to do is we're going to take these two edges and just cross them and swap them. And so this is the um, coupling. And so this is kind of working at a level of the atoms of the probability space. Um, and the argument to show that this generates the configuration model conditioned on containing this cycle, this principal cycle um, is an inductive double counting argument going one edge at a time and showing that the conditioning on any subgraph with any number of edges can be um, done in precisely this way. Um, and then after that, what we've left with is a horrible amount of counting, none of which is particularly difficult. So I'm going to completely leave it out because counting is very doable. Um, and so this say that um, we just count the subgraphs and check that the expectation is the expectation that we expected. Um, and then we get our result that um, the um, number of cycles of a, at least a given length follows a Poisson distribution. And so the probability that um, the k fungus cycle is at least this, is the probability that this is a most k. This um, nice Poisson distribution that we've just found. Um, and so that's, all of that I had to say about the proof. And so I'll just move on to um, a few little open questions that I'd be interested in knowing the answer to. Um, and so things that are kind of like general further studies, um, what about different models, different models of random graphs, different models of random directed graphs, any other com combinatorial object that we want that has an like some kind of component structure would be interesting to know if it follows any kind of similar kind of phase transition um, model. Uh, I know in particular random hypergraphs do seem to follow this um, kind of um, phase transition. I think random geometric graphs in some way was also had a phase transition um, depending on how close you how close you are when you get connected. Uh, and then another problem that I didn't really mention degree conditions, but there are a lot of implicit degree conditions. So the result that I just talked about, you can do with maximum degree about n to the sixth. And so if the maximum degree is really large, maybe something completely different happens. Maybe everything goes crazy, who knows? It would be interesting to know about. Um, and also there's um, this critical window uh, for the direct configuration model. So we can also ask what happens here. This isn't yet known. Um, and so that's, that's all I wanted to talk about. So thanks for listening. Um, thank you so much, Matt. Uh, let's do a round of applause if everyone can please unmute and then I'll count to three and then we'll clap. One, two, three. Right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh.
uh, undirected uh, models, undirected. Is it a study uh, you uh, mentioned about the stone component of the directed configuration model? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you use random model. Uh, but uh, in your question, uh, you mentioned about uh, other uh, models. But yeah. I, uh, I say about uh, analogous problems. For example, is it a studied undirected models or uh, is it possible uh, some direction to do it or something like that or other models uh, in directed or undirected model? We will say about a uh, hyper um, uh, models and something like that. Yeah, so what I'm saying is so hyper graphs, so directed hyper graphs are kind of nuts. I don't really know anything about them. I looked at them like once and got scared. Um, so all the, the results that I know exist are for direct for undirected stuff um, and then the little like two or three results that we have in the graphs for the directed stuff i mean i'd certainly be interested in knowing what happens in various different directed and undirected cases um if they're possible but yeah in general adding directions to anything that's not a graph seems very difficult thanks Does anyone else uh, have any questions? Could you actually go back to the slide with your um, main results? Uh, I just want to have another look at it. Uh, yeah. Rest back out enough time, so we'll get Cool. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, maybe I'll end the recording and then we can uh, have some informal discussion. Thanks again, Matt. No.